Welcome to the Cornelian community and to Ithaca, Umdaba Mandela. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here today. I am not a revolutionary, but I would like to share my story with you today. I was born in 1982 in South Africa, in Soweto, during the time when the apartheid government was at the helm of society. A government so harsh that in fact, if a child was born from a mixed race couple, it would remove that child and place it in a separate area of purely mixed race people, separate from both parents. So you can imagine the harshness, the brutality that existed during that time. But I was very lucky because soon after I was born, I moved to stay with my grandmother, Evelyn, in a small town called Ofenwaba in the Eastern Cape. But I remember one day, my parents told me and said, we're going to visit your grandfather in jail. And I was eight years old at this time, and so I had a typical image of what jail would be like. Concrete bars, police everywhere, dogs, etc. But when we got there, it was nothing like what I had imagined. It was a house. And the only real security that I saw was barbed wire. And I didn't understand that my grandfather had actually been separated from other prisoners and removed from Robben Island and put in this house in isolation for four years because they were trying to break him down mentally to say Madiba, as he's fondly called, using our clan name. Madiba, you're old now. Leave this political fight. Denounce your organization, denounce your comrades. Enjoy the rest of your days with your family and your grandchildren. And of course, we know how that went. And so when I got there, it was a beautiful house, a house more beautiful than the one I lived in. There was a swimming pool. I didn't have a swimming pool. We watched The NeverEnding Story. Do you remember that? I watched it. We had a great lunch. There was a chef. We met the man, of course, tall, dark, handsome figure who was interested in every single one of us because he was seeing us for the very first time. Hi, how are you? What is your name? How old are you? What's your favorite subject at school? And so that was the first time I had an idea of what I wanted to grow up. Unlike many kids who want to be a doctor, a lawyer, I told myself that day, when I grow up, I want to go to jail. <laughs> and of course, that's not what it is right now. But literally two weeks later, Nelson Mandela was released from jail and the whole country went into jubilation. I mean, aunties, grandpas, grandmothers, you name it, even the cats and dogs were on the streets dancing, <laughs> celebrating the release of this magnificent man. But you know, I didn't see him for another probably three years, right? Because he had to go straight back into the political fight. And so one day, I'm in Soweto playing marbles with my friends, and this black BMW pulls up. And a gentleman walks out with a suit and tie, and he says, are you Ndaba? I say, yes. He says, I've been sent by your grandfather to come and fetch you. Let's go. I say, no, sir, I'm not going with you. <laughs> Stranger danger. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm not going with you. He says, do you have any idea who your grandfather is? Do you want me to get fired? Do you want me to lose my job? I say, sir, I'm not going with you. Please, please, he pleaded and begged. I said, no, I cannot. Eventually, the man gave up, and he left. And so later that day, my parents came home, and I told my father what had transpired. And my father said to me, if the man comes again, you must go with him. And funny enough, the man came back later that week. And so I went with him. And off we went into a leafy white suburb in the northern parts of Johannesburg and a big house, security, chef, you know, the works. And I met the man there, and he said to me, Ndaba, education is the most powerful tool you can use to change your world. And so your father and your mother never had the opportunity, and I'm making sure that they go to university. And I don't want them to worry about you. 
So when they at school, you're gonna stay here with me. And that is the day I moved in with my grandfather at the age of 11 years old. And I stayed with him till the very end. Years later, my mother died of HIV AIDS in 2003. Two years later, my father died of HIV AIDS. And now, there was a press conference that would be held for the Mandela family to tell the world what had happened. How did your father die? And so we came together and we said, and we discussed as a family, what are we gonna say? And so one of my cousins raised a hand and said, well, HIV doesn't kill you. It only kills your immune system, so you're unable to defend yourself against common colds and tuberculosis, etc." And my grandfather said, no, we shall not do that. We shall simply tell the world my son has died because he contracted HIV AIDS, full stop. And we went as a united family, sat in front of the table as my grandfather read the statement to the world. And that was the very first time that a prominent family had disclosed to the world that we had been affected by HIV AIDS. And so it started a, a, a long road of us fighting the stigma of HIV AIDS. Because more than anything, the stigma of HIV AIDS was killing our people. Because for the first time, a disease had a moral question attached to it. Because how do you contract HIV AIDS? Because you've engaged in dirty behavior. You have cheated, you have been promiscuous, and so on. And so people were literally dying in silence, dying in shame because of this. But because we showed the world that we're a united family and we have to fight the stigma, we decided to fight this disease head on. And it gave courage to other people around the country, around the continent of Africa, and everywhere else to be able to start fighting this disease head on. You know, fast forward a few years later, I remember coming to America for the very first time. And uh, we went to Disney World, of course. And I remember we were in the line, lining up to go to the um, roller coaster. And eventually we'll get to the front and we'll meet a gentleman who's helping. Hey, how are you? Oh, lovely, lovely. Where are you from? Oh, I'm from South Africa. South Africa, oh wow. How big do the lions get there? And I'm like, I look at my cousin, I'm like, sorry sir, I don't work at the zoo. I have no idea how big lions get. And then we traveled to London. Hey, how are you? Where are you from? From South Africa. Oh my God, I heard your country's dangerous. Do I need security to come and travel to your country? I say, no, sir. Um, my grandfather's a president. I don't have security. I think you'll be just fine. And then, you know, we traveled to New York, and I realized that People outside of the continent of Africa have very limited knowledge on Africa. And the main knowledge that they have is the information that is perpetrated by mainstream media. To say that Africa is a place of war, poverty, disease, and dictators. And the only positive thing, safari. Animals. And I said, no, we have to do something about this. We have to change the image of Africa. We need to break down these misconceptions. And so I went back home, and at the time I was working at Investec, which is one of the biggest uh, investment banks. So I recruited all eight black people that were working there. And um, I told them my feelings about this image of Africa. And um, you know, what struck me that day is that each and every one of us on that table felt the very same way. And so it was apparent that we need to change the image of Africa. And how do we change the image of Africa? Because this is not something that's gonna happen overnight. And so we decided that we're gonna start a foundation to empower young Africans, young Africans to heighten the level of pride and confidence in being African. To say that I am an African, I know what it means to be an African, and I am proud of it. And so we decided the best way would be through education, entrepreneurship development, and celebrating African culture. South Africa is a very wealthy country. 
Our infrastructure is state of the art. And when you wake up in the middle of Santon, you would think you're in a country of the future, somewhere in West Europe, right? But you wouldn't think that. My own friend traveled there, and he was there for 10 days. And only on the day he was supposed to leave did he realize that he was in Africa. Because everything that he experienced was so amazing, right? And that's when Africa Rising was born. And entrepreneurship became one of our key components in making sure that, you know, we as Africans need to be at the forefront of the development that's taking place on our continent. We cannot allow multinational corporations to come and always be the ones to take the principal benefit. If Americans are thriving in America and the English are thriving in Britain, shouldn't the Africans be thriving in Africa? So we felt very passionately that we need to do this. And so for us, you know, when I look at the young people growing up in my village, I realize that young people in my village finish high school without even touching a computer. And yet, you look at the Japanese society, for example, where kids are starting to learn computers and interact with computers from the age of three, four years old. So how are we going to compete on a global scale? How are we going to stand proud, shoulder to shoulder, and talk about the development that needs to take place on the global level? The only way is to make sure that we focus on empowering our young people to have the necessary skills and tools in order for them to break the cycle of poverty. And so creating this entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial ecosystem becomes a very key measure and a very key component of what we do at the Africa Rising Foundation. Firstly, we need to have a space for young entrepreneurs. We need to be able to, with our community, using the community centers, using the community halls, whether it be a museum, whether it be even a clinic, whether it be a container that is used for multi-purpose, whether it be a library, a computer center, we need to have a space where young people can work on their ideas undisturbed, without fear, without any threat. Secondly, we need mentors. These young people coming from villages unable to have access to technology need to have mentors who can push them in the right direction and sharpen the ideas that they have. And finally, we need access to capital. Pearl Ventures is a venture capital fund that we are pushing to raise $10 million in the next three years for South African entrepreneurs. At the same time, we are lobbying for our country's largest pension fund to start and invest in more in venture capital funds. Small business requires seed funding. Present, the banks and private equity funds require collateral and surety, which, of course, young entrepreneurs don't have. So it is up to us and organizations like ourselves to make sure that we create an ecosystem in order for young people to be able to thrive. Many of the times, we have been doing computer coding and computer programming. And you know, the only little motivation that young people want is food. All we do is buy them some McDonald's, some pizza. They don't ask for much, right? They just want to make sure that they are able to actually have the right energy that will allow them to focus and, and take out that, that skill, that energy, right? So many people have talent, but all they need is a simple opportunity to access information, to be guided in the right way, right? Here we are in America. We talk about the American dream, big house, big car, white picket fence, golden retriever, 2.1 kids, <laughs> right? But is that the dream and aspirations of all Africans? No. They just want to be able to have a decent job, which will provide them
decent standard of living, right? So they can be able to freely go to work and express themselves without fear or threat from a government, from an elderly person, so that we can break the cycle of poverty. Now, we cannot do it alone. There's an old African proverb that says, go alone and you can go fast, but go together and we can go far. And that is one of the principles that we try to teach young people in this world. Aside from computer programming, we're also involved in agricultural development. If you ask a young person today, what is success? How does success look for you? They say, no, I'm wearing a suit, I got my briefcase, and I'm walking to my air-conditioned building, right? And every day they complain that they don't have the opportunity, they don't have the computers, and they're walking to school, working to work. And I say, but you know, the very same ground that you're working on can be turned into a farm. You can plant over there. You can use that crop and sell it on the market, right? Because they don't realize that the land is one of the key ways in which you can provide food for yourself as well as shelter. And that has become the big question in today's South Africa. And one of the words is land appropriation without compensation. And it's become a very difficult task, right? Because there have been generations of landowners, right? The first guys came, they removed the blacks. Okay, now we're planting, we're moving. Ta -ta 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 -ta. But then along the line came a man who bought the farm from another white man. He didn't get it for free. He didn't get passed from his generation. So what happens to that guy? And you hear reports on ABC, and you hear Trump saying something rude on Twitter about dark, deep continent of Africa, and you wonder, are these things really true? No, they're not. There is nothing that has happened in South Africa right now. In South Africa, we are currently having a conversation, making sure that all stakers are involved. Civil society, the government, private sector, even the clergy and the religious groups are involved in this because you know churches are one of the most prominent sort of people in society. And having a church means you have land, right? So everybody is having that conversation. Not a single piece of land has been taken away from anybody in South Africa. We realize and understand that we have to come to the table, share our different perspectives, and find a truly equitable way in how we're going to go from point A to point B. But one thing we must understand is that that land needs to be transformed, needs to be transferred to the rightful owners. How do we skill and train our people? Because there are thousands and thousands of farm workers who have passion for the land, who love the land, but may not necessarily know how to do a balance sheet, right? So we need partnerships with people like yourselves. Cornell University, the Entrepreneurship Hub. This is why I'm here. I'm not just here to sell my book. You thought I was here to sell my book. <laughs> no, guys, it's much bigger than selling my book. But I will talk about my book. <laughs> How can I not? You know, it took me about two years to write this book. And I wrote this book because this year we're celebrating 100 years of Nelson Mandela. And this was my tribute to Nelson Mandela. You know, many young people know of Nelson Mandela, but don't truly understand the great value he plays as why he has become one of the most admired and loved leaders in the 21st century. I don't talk about Nelson Mandela the president or Nelson Mandela the revolutionary. I talk about Nelson Mandela the grandfather the man who scolds you for making a mistake. You know, he was such a neat freak, by the way. <laughs> he would walk past my room and see two, three things next to the laundry basket, not inside the laundry basket. 
he would come and find me wherever I was. <laughs> Go and clean your room. I remember once I had lost my school jersey for the second time. And of course, it was winter time, and I had to tell him because I needed a new jersey. And eventually, I had the courage to go and tell him. <clears throat> and he said, what? Today, you will sleep outside. <laughs> I was like, damn, granddad. <laughs> OK. So off I went. And you know, it was 4 or 5, you know, getting dusk, playing with my soccer ball. And, ah, ain't nothing, ain't nothing. Now it's getting really dark. And as it's getting dark, I see Mama Oli, who's, who's, who's the lady that cooks for us, bringing a blanket. I'm like, oh man, I'm really sleeping outside. <laughs> and maybe 20 minutes later, the old man comes standing in front of the porch and he calls me. Actually, no, I lie, he runs like this. <laughs> yes, granddad. Listen here, if you ever lose another jersey, you will definitely sleep outside. Now go inside, eat your supper, and go straight to bed. As harsh as it was, I never lost another jersey. You know, Nelson Mandela was somebody that really cared for compassion. Not cared for compassion, but cared for humanity. His compassion exuded his, his being. You know, during the time when he was in jail, there was a rule that no god could guard his cell for more than three months at a time. Because Nelson Mandela, whether you're five years old or 75 or 35 or black or white or girl or boy, he will become your friend whether you like it or not. So in jail, Nelson Mandela taught himself, even before, to be fluent in Afrikaans, to read and write Afrikaans. And so when the wardens got letters from their loved ones, some of them didn't finish school, some of them did not have the education that Nasman did. And so Madiva would take those letters and translate them for the warden that was guarding him. And of course, that would touch him very, very much, right? And so now you find the warden smuggling in extra couple of slices of bread for Madiba, <laughs> extra blanket for Nelson Mandela, extra couple of fruits for Nelson Mandela. And when the authorities found this out, they were completely devastated and obviously were angry, and they would change the guard. But when the next guard came in, the same thing would happen, <laughs> right? And so they had to have the rule. You cannot guard this man for more than three months because he will affect you. <laughs> and that's the one thing I learned from Nelson Mandela. You can imagine at our house, Michael Jackson came twice to visit Nelson Mandela for his birthday. Mike Tyson, I met at my home. I met Fidel Castro in my home. Lennox Lewis, former President George W. Bush, kings and queens, you name it. But Nelson Mandela treated those people the very same way he treated Mama Oli, who cooked for us, and Albert, who cleaned the garden, and Uncle Mike, who was the driver. Because Nelson Mandela understands that regardless of your history, your sex, your age, or your history, we all have the capacity to achieve greatness. Now, I want every single one of you to stand up right now and hold your hands up like this. And to repeat after me. I am a leader. I can't hear you guys. Can we put some oomph into it? I am a leader. I am a leader. What, I can dream, what I can dream, I can achieve. I can achieve. Working, together, Working together, we can achieve anything. We can achieve anything. It, is in our hands it is in our hands to make a better world. Make a better world. Thank you. Who has a question for Ndaba? Here we go. Hi, so I am an African farmer. Um, yes, sir. And I'm an entrepreneur. Um, the call that you made for partners with your foundation, does it include Africans? I'm Nigerian and I'm here as a short-term scholar, so I would love to mentor some of your people. 
Thank you very much, sir. We'd really appreciate your time. You know, it only takes one hour a week to sit with a young child, ask him about his week, his homework, what his challenges are. One hour a week can make a big difference in a person's life. That's all we ask for, ladies and gentlemen. One hour a week. So please don't be shy to become a mentor. Hello, Mr. Mandela. Yes, sir. Welcome to Ithaca. Thank you. Um, so I have a question for you, uh, and you can feel free not to answer this if it goes into a territory that you consider too political. But uh, you brought up the subject of land in South Africa, and uh, President Michel of Mozambique is purportedly said to President Mugabe of Zimbabwe many years ago, the expression, keep your whites. Keep your what? Keep your whites, Keep your whites huh? because about 180,000 Portuguese fled Mozambique at the handover, and with it, all of the capital left, and the economy collapsed. Um, you talked about land redistribution in South Africa, which clearly has to happen, I think. Um, how do you do it without the economy collapsing? Uganda collapsed, Zimbabwe collapsed, uh, when all of that capital left. Do you have an idea? And I if do. You don't, I do. Thank you. Uh, I was very lucky to be raised by Nelson Mandela. And one of the quotes that he said is, in order to defeat your enemy, you must work with your enemy because then he becomes your partner. Right? Hence, I was saying we're having a conversation right now with everybody in our country. The mistake that they did, Uganda, Zimbabwe, is that they chased them out without having learned the skills that they lost many generations ago. Because even before the Europeans arrived in Africa, we were running very successful farms. But because of the apartheid, the segregation, the racism, and we became marginalized and removed from our land over many generations, we lost those skills. And so now, the only way we can continue making sure that our country is successful is by holding each other's hand, working together. And so I have great confidence in our new president, Cyril Ramaphosa, that we're engaging all the stakeholders, right? And that is going to be a slow transition that's going to happen over the next seven to 10 years. That is how we're going to do it and succeed and make sure that everybody that's involved does not feel uh, cut out or disenfranchised or, you know, a victim, basically. Yeah. I, uh, I'm Ben Ancilia. I'm from Tanzania. And um, I remember when I was growing up, there was a struggle for um, the uh, anti-apartheid movement in South Africa. So there are some camps in Tanzania and like some of the other African countries were um, helping South Africa, like working with the South Africans to end apartheid. So uh, one thing I've noticed after that, a few years uh, after uh, 1994, there have been like, uh, I don't know, like there's not been that free uh, communication between South Africa and the other African countries. And um, um, I have I've not seen many South Africans in Tanzania, for example. I was in Cape Town in uh, 2013, and um, coming from Tanzania with the stories, I was not feeling free like to go out and interact with the fellow black South Africans. Um, and there are stories about people being killed, like xenophobia and that kind of thing. So uh, my question is, um, how are you, um, trying to address this to make sure that Africans in other countries uh, feel at home with their fellow black South Africans. And the same thing with the fellow black South Africans, that there's that um, feeling like we all come from the same roots, so we feel like family and um, brothers and sisters. How are you addressing that? Thank you. Thank you. You know, as you said, Julius Nerere was one of the most revolutionary leaders. All the different liberation movements, he provided space for them in order for them to fight for their liberation movement. And he's one of my biggest heroes. And to be honest with you, I have been very 
shocked and disturbed by the xenophobic attacks that happened in our country because it's as though our people forgot their history because the, 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 the freedom that we now enjoy, we did not win it by ourselves. We did it with the assistance of many of our brothers and sisters across the continent of Africa. And I know many countries that my grandfather went to to get that support, you know. So it reminds me also of the story of America, actually. You know, how do we now, in the 21st century, or enjoying our prosperity, forget that our country was built by foreign nationals, even here in America, right? <laughs> It was. But now we're in a good spot. We want to say, hey, go back home. Let us enjoy the fruits of our labor. No, this is the fruits of all our labor. Together we made this country what it is today. And so through our foundation, like my brother has stood up and said he's from Nigeria, he's a farmer, he wants to be a mentor. We are providing platforms for people of all nationalities, doesn't matter where they come from, to mentor young people in South Africa. Because the small things like that, that will allow young people to say, oh, I want to be a farmer. He's a farmer, but he's in Nigeria. But hey, he's a black, I'm black. You know? And to be able to work through those things. So I can only do the little that I can, but together we can do much more. So brother, I would love to work with you and see how we can Make sure that the, build, that the bridge that was built those decades ago becomes bigger and bigger and better and there are more flow going through our countries. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Ms. Mandela. Good evening. My name is Prince Mafu. I'm from Ghana. And as an African, I want to ask you this question. Um, do you think that Africa is truly rising? Some people consider the issue of corruption to be Africa's biggest issue. Some consider ethnic div division to be Africa's biggest issue. If you, if you take Ghana as an example, we have over 250 languages, 250 different tribes. If you take Nigeria, we have about 400 different tribes. Do you think that if these factors were to be taken away, if there were, no, if were, if there were to be no corruption, no ethnic division, do you think that Africa would really rise? Africa, my brother, is already rising. When you look at the top 10 growing economies of the world today, seven of those are in the continent of Africa. Every country, including this one, has corruption. Do you know Mr. Trump, you? <laughs> eh? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that right now, when you look at fashion, for example, right, whether you are in the middle like Hugo Boss or you're high end like Louis Vuitton, every single fashion house in the world today is getting inspiration to design their new lines from the continent of Africa, right? I don't have to talk about music and dancing, you already know about that, <laughs> right? If I talk about the most beautiful islands for you to take your family to go and visit, on the east coast you have Mauritius, on the west coast you have the Seychelles, you have Cap Verde. That is Africa, my brother. And those are the places that where people are going to now and discovering. The money is coming back into Africa, it's flowing into Africa. So how can Africa not be rising, my brother? Well said. We are rising, brother. And you need to come and join us. <laughs> Awesome. Greetings, Ndaba. My name is Edwina Ward, and I'm so honored to be in your presence, of course, along with everyone else. My question is for young people, specifically college students. Oftentimes, we get informed of a great speech, um, a great topic, and then we go back into our dorms or, or into our separate places and not really feel empowered, not really know which way to go to really make an impact. So what message would you have for each one of us to feel very inspired to understand that the moment we walk out of this door, it's an opportunity for us to make an impact? Thank you. I would say that we must remember the one thing that I think 
this new administration has highlighted is that we do not have to wait and look for the president, the prime minister to lead us. We ourselves can affect change. And often we always look to someone else to do the change, when in fact, a simple thing like mentoring a young person one hour a week can cause a great impact in that young person's life, right? I am saying to you, this is my email address, ndaba, N-D-A-B-A, at arfoundation.co. Write to me, let us chat. I'm on social media, ndaba Mandela, Instagram, ndaba underscore Mandela, right? <laughs> Hit me up, sister. If you're feeling down, if you need some motivation, give me a shout. I am here to tell you that you don't have to wait for your sister or your brother or your mother. You yourself can make a great impact in your own community because that's where you have to start. You have to start in your own community, right? And let me tell you, the moment you reach out to somebody, to a community, to a school, because I'm sure there's something in our community that doesn't sit well with us, right? So you have to find something within yourself that you are passionate about, that you feel strongly about, that you want to change. Because if you're just doing it for the sake of the boy that you like, or you're doing it for the sake of your mom because your mom says you must be an accountant, no, you have to do something because you feel strongly about it and you want to change that thing, right? And talk to your roommate and give me a shout. Thank you. Okay, your grandfather was a great champion of democracy in Africa. Do you think the ideals that he stood for have been followed by our leaders? And secondly, what is your views on Chinese investment in Africa? Yes. <laughs> well, um, you know, yes, we, we, we respect democracy very well, but it does not necessarily work very well for every system. Let's look at Rwanda, for example, right? Paul Kagame, he's been in power for 25 years. They complain to say that this man, any opposition that comes across, he puts them under house arrest, they go to jail, they disappear. But is Rwanda not one of the highest growing economic countries on the continent of Africa? They have the highest uh, 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 internet, they have the cleanest city in Africa, right? I'm not saying that dictatorship is good, but what I'm saying is democracy is not always the best system, is what I'm saying. There are many other systems that suit different nations. But for me, what Paul Kagame is doing in his country, he's doing good for his people, he's doing very well. And of course, he has to step down. So the one thing that we have a problem with in our continent is succession. We never think about what What's next? After me, who's going to come, right? It's better if you are there for 20 years, you do good for your people, and then you take somebody and you groom them and you say, this is how you do it. So I agree with you. Yes, in large parts of the continent, they don't respect the rule of law or, 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 or having you know, okay, uh, elections ever so often. But it does not mean that it's the best system of, of, of rule. It's the, it's the least of all evils. That's how people are describing democracy. Now let's talk about these Chinese guys. Let me tell you, I like the Chinese people. I have nothing wrong against the Chinese people. These are my people too, right? But at the same time, who are the people who are signing these deals that don't make sense for the African people? It's the president. It's the minister, right? Because that man was given a big brown envelope or maybe a Nike bag full of cash, I don't know, right? And so he decided to sign that agreement that didn't make sense, right? The man is coming to build a bridge. Yes, we need, we need the infrastructure development, right? He's coming to the build a bridge, but now he's gonna bring all the labor from China. Then he's gonna bring all the materials for the bridge from China. And then he's going to say, yes, it's cost 50 million to build this bridge. Pay 50 million, I'm going to own 40%. You're like, hey, bro, but how does that make sense? How can I pay a dollar for this water, but you own 40%? But guess what? 
The deal doesn't make sense, but the man still signs it. So whose fault is that? That man has been corrupted because he got a big bag of money in the Nike bag. I don't know, right? So it is up to us. It's our leadership. This comes down to a question of leadership, my brother, right? We need to make sure that we're putting the right leaders in place, number one. Number two, we need to make sure that we are the ones who are affecting policy, right? No president, for example, can sign a deal above $5 billion without all the cabinet ministers approving the deal. These are some of the policy uh, measurements we can put in place, right? But are we doing that? You see, the problem with us youth is that we like to complain, right? And we'd like to make money. We like to pop bottles, right? And you like to shake the booties. <laughs> but then we don't actually get involved in civic society. We need to be involved in public service ourselves and not expect other people to do the work for us. When are we going to get involved and say that I tried to change the policy on how China invests in Africa? When are we going to get involved and say enough is enough, we are the ones to make the difference? Leave the old dogs. The old dogs are not going to change. You can't train. You can't train. Old dogs do tricks. You cannot. Thank you, friend. <laughs> you cannot. So why are you expecting miracles when miracles will not come? The only miracles that are going to come is from us, my brother. So we have to be the ones to get involved in those political debates, get involved in policy formation. That's where you're going to see the change. Okay, one final question in the back. Then we have to break for our reception. Okay, thank you so much for the talk. Uh, this is Ken from Kenya. Could you comment about Africa rising and also in terms of adoption of genetically modified materials? As uh, South Africa has been a lead uh, on adoption like of BTMAs to and curb the constraint of pests and diseases. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Africa rising, we do not use GMOs. Uh, we work with a company called Sakata, which is a Japanese company and a South African company known as Mayford Seeds, who uh, produce high quality seeds. Uh, I'm not sure, where, are you implying that we use GMOs? Is that the information you saw on the website? No. You're asking if we use GMOs. Okay, no, we don't use GMOs. Uh, we use uh, proper things, my brother. We, we use the right stuff. <laughs> we use the right stuff. Um, but yeah, you know, for us, um, agriculture is, goes hand in hand with the land question, right? We need to promote our young people to get involved in agricultural business. Right now, we have a, a program that we call 100, 100, what? This one I can't help you with. A million, no, I got it, I got it. <laughs> a million food gardens for Mandela. A million food gardens for Mandela. So basically, this project is all about food security. We are speaking with the private sector as well as the government. So we raise money from the private sector to buy seeds that we distribute with the assistance of the government in rural households. Two years ago, the inflation in South Africa was 9%. So it's becoming increasingly difficult for poor people to afford food, right? So we're saying that if you have your own food garden at home, at least all the vegetables that you plant can come from your own home, and then the rest you can buy in the grocery store. So that is the program that we're using. And all of the seeds that are used, none of them are GMOs. Great. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.